by God, the opportunity I was going to do that. And that was my motivation of migrating from Agunan Suedro to Accra. Got to Accra, and um, inspired by Reverend Dr. Mensah Otabila, I heard him say, in life, you always have something to start with. And this was out of the background of the fact that I had a cousin who I worked with, and um, for some reason, the business didn't still succeed. So he had to ask it to relocate. But I told myself that forward ever, backwards never. So I said, when I heard Dr. Tabu say, in life, you always have something to start with at the time, uh, I had my strength. What I thought I was going to do was to trade my strength for money. And that was how come I ended up in Kanishi as a what? As a Kayanu, a head porter, what, what do you call in English? Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing. I was on the street. I was sleeping on the street and um, carrying stuff and um, made a little bit of money. But of course, I love God. One of the things that my parents gave to me was they gave me God. So at a very early age, we learned to be self-reliant and God-dependent. You depend on God and you rely on yourself. And so that gave me that capacity of a sense of working hard. And then I would pay my tithe, and then I would make sure that I would save some You money. believe in paying tithe? I believe so Recently, much. there's been a lot of controversy about paying tithe, and people say that New Testament Christians shouldn't pay tithe. Just as a digression, what's your view on tithe? Do, do well, you still pay? I still pay tithe. I, I think that my view on tithe I mean, there was something called in theology that the law first mentioned. Mm -hmm. The first time the offering was mentioned was when it was related to what Cain and Abel did. Mm -hmm. The Bible said that God accepted the offering of Abel and then didn't accept the offering of Cain. And God said to Cain that if you do well, you'll be pleased. Now, the issue is what did God see in the offering of Abel for him to say he did well? Three things that he saw. Number one, he saw quality. Number two, he saw introspection. And number three, he saw preparation. Um, what you give to God has to be quality. What you give to God has to introspectively put together. And what you give to God has to be the best. So the Bible called it the firstlings of his first fruits. Mm -hmm. The firstlings gives an idea that they were representative of me. He had probably a 10 goat or 10 sheep. It was a firstlings of all the 10. And if the firstlings of all the 10, some were fatter than the other, he took time to get the fat. And so if you look at the law of first mention, you have a sense of what tithe was. And that's why our pastor call it the first fruit. Mm -hmm. Now, if you move from Cain and Abel, you come to the second offering that was offered, and that was Noah. When Noah had woken up from this beautiful dream, and everything he owed had been destroyed. Everything had been destroyed. The Bible said the first thing he did was he's offered. In the time of scarcity, you have to learn to what? Offer sacrifices to God, and that was given. And then the third was Abraham when we heard God wanted to demand a covenant offering from Abraham. And so when you look at the law of first mention, you graduate it down to Noah to Abraham, you get to appreciate that God in Bible times talked about what the tenth. Now come back to the New Testament. The Bible says that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And so what is Melchizedek? Melchizedek was not the Levitical order of priesthood. Melchizedek was the priesthood after original intention of God. Because Bible theologians say they don't know who gave birth to Melchizedek. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. So he was, if you like, referencing our Christ mm -hmm. as Christ was. So if Melchizedek, Jesus, came from the tribe of um, Judah, and he didn't come with the tribe of Levi. So how was then Jesus going to fulfill the order of being a Levi or being a priest when it was a reserve of the institution of the Levitical priesthood? The only way that was going to happen was that Jesus, the Bible says, was the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which is higher mm -hmm. than an institutional what, priesthood. And so I believe seriously in tithe, reference what Jesus did and reference what Ken and Abel did, Noah did, and Abraham did. Mm. So I mm. seriously believe in tithe. I think the controversy has been the fact that two things, people give tithe, uh, people give monies, but they also think that they don't have a sense of accountability from the stewards that collect yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, this lifestyle and all kinds of things, and that sort of had, if you like, um, giving people a recourse to question why do you give money to a certain man of God to do the things that you're doing? But if people become accountable, people become very careful that it's as important to give as just as important to also account, then you're going to get people to see what you put the money to use. And for that reason, people are going to have their little bit of what relaxation to do the things that they do. Mm, I see. Points well made. So after being a pet porter, what other business did you do? We are, we are building up onto your story All right. as, so, a, as a banker. As a head porter, I mean, by the grace of God, like I told you, so tight helped me. Mm -hmm. I started selling um, used clothes, 
what mm -hmm. has come to be the lone man in our local palace as falls. Mm -hmm. And so I dress well because I go for first selection. So I need to, mm -hmm. I knew the, what to select and what not to select. Mm -hmm. Over time, I started buying the bills. Mm -hmm. And um, over time, I thought that it was a little bit tedious. But of course, every Christian, you want to seek progress. Mm -hmm. And every decision that I made, I had to do a lot of praying. And Greater Works for me was my transitional moment of Shelu, where I go to God and say, God, what next? Mm -hmm. And so in one of those moments, I went to God in prayer. I had a 16,000 CDs, and I was trusting God to get 4,000 CDs to make 20,000 to do something. And then the Lord said to me that I should bring that money to him as an offering. It was unbelievable. It wouldn't make sense, but I did. The next day, I was driving in the neighborhood, Bubuashi, and I saw Pasco Printing Press. Walked to the place, and when I walked to the place, I met this man, Mr. Buaji. The Spirit of God gave me word of knowledge, and I told him he fell in love with me. And fast forward, he ended up giving me machines worth $500,000. That time, Paul, 1998, mm -hmm. I set up my first business with almost about, um, today, almost about 2 million CDs. So from... Um, selling foes to selling bills. What did you tell Mr. Boaji that made him give you 5,000? Um, well, it was spiritual. I mean, he, Mr. Boaji had come from Canada. He had challenged with his marriages and things. I didn't know him from Adam. And the Lord spoke to you? And the Lord spoke to, to me. To speak to Mr. Boaji? And speak to him, about Mr. Boaji. About that. Were you a practicing pastor? I, I, I think I love God. Every child of God is a, is a, is a minister by default. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I function in that. Where I is mean, Mr. Boaji today? Mr. Boaji has gone back to Canada. I see. Yes. I see. Yes. So his marriage worked and everything that God spoke through me actually came to pass and was phenomenal. So Mr. Abuaji thinks of you at Wesleyan as a pastor? Not only him, quite a number of people because oh, I... Oh, you've done this with, with many people? I, I, I preach. I preach. I, 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 I preach. I see. I, I preach. I'm a lover of God. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and um, th that's what my life is all about. Th that's why I function properly. And so I preach, I, 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 I mm. speak the word of God. So he gave you 5,000 CDs? $500,000 worth of equipment. $500,000? Half, half a million. Half a million dollars, dollars that time of equipment. Because I obeyed God with 20,000 offering. CDs at the time, if you like 200 million CDs you're, at that time. You're referring to half a million dollars? Half a million dollars. Worth of equipment? Worth of equipment. He dashed it to you? He set me up. He credited me. He, he, he sort of gave me those goals on credit. And that's how I started my first printing press called Whitlock. So you went into your first printing press without putting any money in? Without putting any money in. So you, bought, you had all this equipment? I had all this equipment. And the company is still alive. I see. Yes. And so you started printing? I started printing. And it's amazing. I mean, when I was in school, I was selling books. And so I knew the book business, you know. And um, it will help you to know what I made a statement that my parents taught us who God is. Mm -hmm. So at a very early age, we knew what it means to be self-reliant and God-dependent. Mm -hmm. When I was in school, one of the challenges that we had to deal with was school fees. And every time it was school fees, um, uh, exams time, I'll come, they want to sack me, for, and I'll pray. And I'll say to God, God, please let the head, the business I get off my name. And Paul, you will not believe it. Not once, not twice, not thrice, many times. They'll mention the name, and for some reason, they won't mention my name. But that also set me thinking, and that thinking was a productive thinking. And that gave me the opportunity to start selling books in school. I don't know if you remember O Level, Samuel to Lessons and Structure. Yeah, yeah, so I started yeah. selling that book, yeah. and um, I sold it, made so much money, and um, Started going to other schools, started selling it, so started making. So your money. real skill is marketing and communication. I'm a salesperson. That's what you are. Sales. I sell everything. How did you get into banking? Very interesting question. So this is how I got into banking. So I told you about the printing press. Mm -hmm. There was a challenge with the printing press. It was profitable, but liquidity was a challenge. Mm -hmm. So you could do work for the Ministry of Education. I had worked for the Ministry of Education. I had worked for other schools and agencies, but all your money would be in invoices. And in a quest to be able to sustain your operations, it was important that you had to get liquidity. And so I thought about opening a second business, and that second business was going to sell paper. I don't know if you've heard about bond tissue. Yes, yes, bond yes. Bond tissue yes. was yes. a very major uh, merchant in paper. So I attempted that, and um, it didn't go too well. So I started a company called OneNet Marketing Console. It was a direct sales company. OneNet. OneNet Marketing Console. It was a direct sales company. The exciting thing about that company was the fact that I was working with young people who were my age at the time, and I was excited because I was able to recruit about 800 people in just a matter of three months. In six months, I had set up 
10 branches nationwide from Bolewa, Tamale. Of direct marketing. Of direct marketing. What were they selling? Anything? They were selling anything. I mean, you have imported stuff, wasn't it? Imported stuff mm -hmm. from Chinese. I mean, mm -hmm. Slim Soap, Slim Tea, and name it. Mm -hmm. All of all. I mean, I brought utensils. Utensils. Mm -hmm. I was the one who brought the massager, the massage machine. Mm -hmm. The chair? Yes. They both the chair and then the oh, plastic see. one. Yes. I was the one who brought that in. Mm -hmm. So um, I've seen God move me from, if you like, the street to where I am. Now, when I started that business, it did so well. The challenge was the fact that the business grew so fast, but systems were challenging. Mm -hmm. So then I asked that my friend, who was an IT guy, come to help me to set up the technology bit of it. Now, when he set that up, we noticed that the best way to be able to do what we're doing was to capitalize the salespeople. So for example, instead of giving you the things to go and sell and bring the money, we're going to capitalize you, and that will tell you the name. That will inform you about how I came up with the okay. name. Okay. I said, why don't you create entrepreneurs out of these 800 people? Mm -hmm. Now, the way to create entrepreneurs out of these 800 people was that, why don't I give them the money? So if you're going to come take goods worth about, let's say, 200 Ghana City, Mm -hmm. I came up with that 200 Ghana City as your seed capital. Mm -hmm. So I loan you that money. And I said, I take it that you're going to take this money from a bank, you're working with it, you're making money, and then you're going to have to pay. And Paul, amazingly enough, as I speak to you, these 800 people that I talked about, some of them are doing amazing stuff. Oh, and you are still in touch with them? I'm still in touch with them. They call me father. They see me as a mentor. They see me as their role model. And so I created 800 entrepreneurs there and there. Mm -hmm. So when I created that, I said, then I needed a structure to sit this in. Because then they began to tell other people, then other people began to come to me and begin to talk to me. So it went beyond our what? Our operation. So the jam seller, the purple seller, and all of that on the street. And I realized that I became very obsessed. Mm -hmm. It was not about the money. It was about the fact that people who could put food on the table, because don't forget mm -hmm. that I had been on the street. So I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be difficult times. And so my excitement was the fact that I was going to be able to create entrepreneurs. So I started with the concept of giving them their first capital. Ah, I see. Yes. Giving your entrepreneurial group their first their capital. Their first capital. On the target marketing. On the target marketing. Mm -hmm. So that was how come I, I generated the name First Capital Plus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then what then happened was that I started getting a lot of market women, and so I needed to grow the model. Mm -hmm. So from that microfinance, if you like, at the time, at the time it wasn't regulated. I mean, I was the father of microfinance in this country. So it was like Susu. It was like Susu kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. But at the time, we were not even taking people's money. We were rather giving people money. How did they give it to you back? They were giving, okay, so the we. The payback. The payback. We did what we call joint and several guarantee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you come, peer pressure, we put you in a group of 12, and then we give what you the money. What is peer pressure? Peer pressure means that you are in a group of 12. 10 people have paid your loan, two people have not paid. And if you don't pay, they don't get money for the second cycle. Oh, you call it peer pressure. Yeah, so you will bring pressure on them. That's interesting. <laughs> they will bring pressure on you to pay so that yeah. they can get the second capital, mm -hmm. third capital, and that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. You know. So I was the father of microfinance in this country. And so it went so well. I mean, many times the Bank of Ghana in most of their presentation will make reference to Atwesian. Oh, I see. It wasn't regulated. No. Oh, I see. No, 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 yes. Yes, so I was using the money lenders license from the Ghana Police Service. Ghana, Ghana Police Service, that was the license I was using. Oh, that's how time. you get the license in those days. Which those year days. was this? This was 2004. Ghana Police Service? Yeah, Ghana Police Service. That's how you got your license yes. for regulation? Money lenders license. Mm. That was how it was. You know, and, and, and it was a beautiful journey because mm -hmm. by 2006, Paul, we had taken care of almost about 4,800 market women. 4,800 wow. market. I mean, today, when I look at everything that had happened, I'm saying with the Barclays or with this multinational banks, look at the guy who needs a 200 Ghana city, who needs a 500 Ghana city, who needs a 300 Ghana I wonder if they will. No, they won't. They won't. I mean, I'm sure you are aware of the Unilever statement. Yes, it just came out recently. Yes, and yeah. the Coca-Cola statement. Yes. Their profits took a nosedive. Because, because the distributors don't have support. They don't have support. That's the value chain. The mm -hmm. guy on the street, mm -hmm. they need a thousand, they need a ten thousand, they need a five thousand. How are you going to get these people to be able to revamp their businesses when the value chain has been terminated? Mm -hmm. For the first in history, Coca Cola had to suffer this because of 
Capital Bank, regardless of how big it was, we understood how to be able to take care of these people. And of course, I'm a base person. So you were in the market, helping the market women. What were they using the money you give them for? Paul, they were using it to sell tomato, you know, because when the people come from the farm gate, mm -hmm. you can get to buy the things a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. So they buy a plantain for like 50 Ghana City. Come the end of the day, they've made almost about 80 Ghana City. So it did is, you have a database with all of them? I did. As we speak, Capital Bank, when we started, I, when I started, so from the microfinance, mm -hmm. I graduated from there to First Capital Plus Savings and Loans. So you became Savings and Loans. So Savings and Loans, you got a license from the Bank of Ghana. We got a license from Bank of Ghana. So Savings and Loans meant that you could take deposits. Yes. Okay. So that was when we started taking deposit. Mm -hmm. So up until this time, we're not taking any deposit. I had grown, grown the money I used to give to these people. And because of the various innovation that I had introduced, they had become based. I mean, Paul, look, when we started First Capital Plus Savings and Loans, we submitted a budget of 35 million cities to the board. They said it's not going to happen. Half year we had done 32 million cities. No, say that again. Well, we started first capital. Before plus then, cities. who were the shareholders of uh, first capital plus cities and loans? Um, first capital plus my good self. Mm -hmm. I was the majority shareholder, Dr. Mm -hmm. Stephen Angel, mm -hmm. um, the co founder, mm -hmm. and um, Osa Thompson Mensa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these were all young people. These were young people. Um, okay. Um, um, I think. I think. I think. And you, you put this together. Yeah, I put it. First together. capital plus savings, savings and, loans. and loans. Where were you headquartered? We're headquartered in Tesano. Tesano. Oh yes, your Tesano place. Yes, Tesano. Okay. Tesano. Okay. That's where we were. And then you had staff there. Yes, we okay. had staff of almost about um, about 420. Oh, that's a lot. Nationwide. We're represented with nationwide. Well, how many branches did you have? We had 23 branches at that time. At the time. Oh, as a, as a, as a new microfinance yes. company, uh, savings and loans. Yes. Yes. I see. All the, we did you first. migrate your clients from the market onto the savings and loans? We did. So that they could now give you deposits? We did. We did. You know, we're the first savings and loan to introduce checkbooks. We're the first oh, savings and loan to introduce ATM. Nobody had done that. We came oh, to that's interesting. Yes. We came to Checkbook be, was a preserve of universal banks. Universal banks. banks. So we, how the savings and loans operate? They were using the savings drawer slip. Okay, but you printed checkbooks. We printed checkbooks. Did you have the Bank of Ghana's permission to do that? Yes, we did. And because the data was, the central system we're using was amazing. And, and that's why, Paul, it sometimes bothers me, the kind of noise that government made to say that we took 482 million, what has come to be known as a shareholder loan. This was no money that we took. You see the kind of background that I've given to you. Yeah. From that level, if you give somebody money and the person didn't pay, that money will begin to accumulate interest upon interest. Because, because I was a going concern, when I submitted my business plan to the central bank, I submitted to them as work in progress. So the capital that I submitted to the central bank was the loans and advances that I've given to these persons, which mm -hmm. were on my box. Mm -hmm. So if I've given you loans and I've submitted that to the central bank as my capital, it means if you don't pay that loan, it hits my capital. Okay, let, let me understand it. I'll, 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 I want to understand this in detail. But before then, let's, let's, let's try and locate the credit that you, have, you deserve for introducing checkbooks and ATM as yeah. a savings and loans. Yeah. The cost of introducing ATM is significant. And that's why only universal banks were doing it. That's right. Because they had capacity to do bigger business. That's right. As savings and loans, you were limited to the kind of business you can that's do. That's right. Did you put ATM machines for the comfort of your customers because you were thinking about becoming an investor? Because you're going to lose money. Yes. Given the amount of money that you were able to take mm. from them, and you are competing with the stand charter, the UMB, who have a lot of more money to do, or, or was it that your, your ATMs were not top level? They were top level. Let me tell you what we we're going to do. It was strategic mm -hmm. because definitely I had a long-term intention of metamorphosing into a bank. Mm -hmm. But this was what we we're going to do. My concept was a single concept. I wanted to have one million customers who were going to get deposit one Ghana CD a day with the bank. And that was going to give us one million Ghana CD float as a bank. And so we started a concept called CDPay. CDPay, when we started, it was just like, we actually originated what has come to be known as mobile money today. CDPay, oh, really? yes. When we started our vouchers, we got to our customers, and people will now do five Ghana, 10 Ghana, 20 Ghana. CDP means what? CDP means that you are going to put one Ghana CD in your savings account every day. So even if, if I have 10, I add one? Yes. Okay. I mean, you're going to do Every one. day, I should put one. So mm -hmm. it is going to put that CD on your mobile phone. Oh, I don't need to come to the bank. You don't need to come to the bank. I see. So the concept of the ATM, you see, 
capital, first capital plus, the idea behind it was a fantastic idea driven by technology, driven by ingenuity, creativity. So what we sought to do was people would not have the luxury of coming to the bank. If they won't have the luxury of coming to the bank, then why don't you go to them? Mm -hmm. So what we did was that you go to them, they have mobile phones, so whatever money you have, you give me the money, I give you a voucher. Mm -hmm. And when I give you a voucher, you scratch the PIN code, you put it in, boom, your money is in the bank. I see, from yes. their phone to their account. From their phone to their, to their, their account. Mm -hmm. Eventually, because they were giving us more than one CD, we changed the name from CDP to Speed Banking. Oh, you had a product called Speed Banking? Yes. We had a product called Speed Banking. Speed because Banking. you found out people were giving you more than one CD. More than one CD. So the name then was uh, defeated, if you like, because mm -hmm. they were giving us more than one CD. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Speed Banking today is mobile money. Mm. What MTN is driving as mobile money originated from us. It's my idea. It's, it's First Capital Plus's idea. Because, you see, I came from the base. I understand the market. I understand the street. Mm -hmm. And that's where, again, my pain comes from what the current guy on the street is going to do. Who is going to look at him to give him 500, 200, 2,000? It is a very painful thing. When I look, when I walk, walk through the market today, because I have base clients, I go to Kaneshi, then they know me. I go to Okanshi, because they are my people. Mm -hmm. And they are complaining. Now they don't want to give us any money. We are not getting, all the microfinances have collapsed. They've lost their money, and all kinds of things. Now the p p problem that I ask, the question that I ask is, who will these big banks give this guy a 200 cities? A 500 cities? No, you a see, thousand it, it cities? It became such that, I mean, if this, if this uh, crisis hadn't happened, we're beginning to, and economic researchers were beginning to look forward to the day when Barclays was going to open the microfinance. Because yes. every big bank, yes. Fidelity was doing yes. it, everyone was doing it. Yes. Because your model was working. Yes, it was working. Yes. Paul, we had a customer base of 122,000. It hadn't happened in the history of Ghana Bank. Because the, the drive was the fact that we had to drive the own bank. Mm -hmm. And banks that had been in existence before we started didn't have anything close to that. And our target was a million customers, and we knew how to do it. And the informal sector in Ghana was growing. It was growing. And trading was growing. Trading was growing. Liquidity became important. Important. Let's come back to the question about shareholder loans. So when, if I was a customer of uh, First Capital Plus Savings and Loans, and mm. you gave me 10000 That's right. When you were reporting to the Bank of Ghana, how did you report that 10000 you have given me as you were migrating to Investor Bank? Good. So it's loans and advances. Mm -hmm. Okay. You so call it loans and advances. Loans and advances. Uh, is, 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 is our capital. Because mm -hmm. if I was so fresh... You have given 10,000 to 10,000 people. Yes. So you're going to have something like 100 million. 100 million, exactly mm -hmm. the point. Mm -hmm. if, was, if I was fresh, then the money was going to be in a bank. Mm -hmm. To say, I want to go confirm that money in the bank. Yeah. But because we're going concerned, the money was not there. The money was with customers. Okay. You, you understand? Mm -hmm. So that money that was with customers is what we presented to Ga Bank of Ghana as loans and advances. Okay. Now, you have become a savings and loans. Remember, when we were a microfinance, we were not re under any regulation. Mm -hmm. Savings and loan has some rigid regulation, mm -hmm. but Universal Bank has more stricter regulation. Mm -hmm. So once we became a Universal Bank, what then happened was that the system and the dashboard applicable for a universal bank is totally different from that of what is savings and loans. Mm -hmm. So then we had to tell the Bank of Ghana that these are the peculiar challenges we have. You've given money to somebody probably four, five, ten years down the line. Interest upon interest had built up and accrued and accumulated mm -hmm. and it's in your books. Now, if you ask me to make provision for that, it means that I would hit capital. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we said no. We don't want to do that. So you can call them legacy issues. Yeah. So that's how we, so we engage the central bank and say, look here, this is what we want to do. We want to clean up our books. And in cleaning up our books, we want to be able to what? Ring fence this non-performing loans. Because under the IFRS, we have what we call classification based on the next 180 days. Mm -hmm. Your first 30 days is what? Current. Second 30 days is standard. Third 30 days, which is 90 days, is substandard. 120 days is uh, bad. 150 days is doubtful, 180 days is a loss. Mm -hmm. So if you have to go by the classification as a universal bank, any money you give out as a loan, come six months, if it has not been recovered, you have to what, provision against it. Mm -hmm. Now, we said the only way this can remain current on our books is that we're going to have to ring fences. This is legacy issues, non-performing loans. We're going to box it together. Now, shareholders was, were going to escrow their shares into treasury. Mm -hmm. Because we had two challenges. 
in as much as we grew fast from a microfinance to a savings and loans into an investor bank, it was the same thing that also sort of gave us a challenge. And the challenge was for us to be able to, as it were, clean up the books and make sure that going forward as an investor bank, we're going to be able to do the things we're supposed to do to achieve the needed success. So we ring fenced it. Two things that was going to happen. If you're going to look for an investor to come in, the investor was going to come into what we call the good bank and not a bad bank. Mm -hmm. The good bank is the one that is doing well, is excelling, is doing fantastic. At the time we did this, the good bank was probably the second or the third profitable bank in Ghana. The good bank on the books of capital. On, on the books of capital. Mm -hmm. So the bad bank is what we ring things and we call it shareholder loan. It was not money that shareholders took from the bank. Which is what was reported. Which was what was reported. And the whole nation was outraged. Obviously, if I was a citizen and I heard that people took that kind of money, I would behave the same. Let me ask you that. In those two weeks that you yourself say the whole nation was outraged, and they were talking about you, and yeah. they called you all sorts of names, they said you had treated the bank like your piggy bank. Can you imagine? You. Why didn't you speak? You know, but when the noises are loud mm -hmm. and you even speak, reason will be challenged. So my approach was just take your time, take it in. I was restrained many times because I thought that what they were saying was purely lack of information. And I was tempted to go out and put the information right. So you didn't chop the money at Capital Bank? I never chop a dime, Paul. Paul, what is the point in our funds? What is it? It is my baby. But that makes sense. It's your bank. It's my bank. I get back to the bank. Well, but they say people set up a bank and rob it. Yeah, but how can you do that? If people do it, looking at where I have come from, mm. migrated from an unregulated institution to a regulated space, and now to a universal bank, why will I want to do that? Paul, mm. I was also being insulted. And that was when I got amazed how narrative can be turned and twisted. And in the absence of information, people can do all kinds of things. I thought that, let me be patient. Um, the matter was under investigation, so if you saw my press release, mm -hmm. I released a press release statement to say, listen, this matter is under EOCO, please be patient, EOCO is currently working on, and in due time, every money will be duly accounted for. And mm -hmm. every money has been duly accounted for. From EOCO to SIT, this thing had been under investigation for the past two years, and that's why I'm having this conversation with you now. Paul, you know, I have restrained myself from yeah, talking yeah, to yeah. you. We are grateful for that. But yes. it's, it's, I mean, it's something that we have to check in this country about. So all the things we had on radio at that time, how were you explaining it to people, your mentors, your shareholders, your customers? Because they said in the morning that Atuisian took X amount of money from liquidity support and chopped it. It was so sad. And so the shareholders knew the story. Um, but it was also going to be very difficult, as like I'm saying to you, to go to people one by one. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible says there is time for everything. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the right time for me to put a story out there for the check. So do you fact. want to sue? I have sued. Oh, you have? I have. Oh, I see. I, I have sued know. the Bank of Ghana. I see. I have. Okay. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. I have. But you're a Christian. You don't want to forgive? I have forgiven but my property must be protected. Mm. My property must be protected under the Property Protection Act. Mm. We are property owning democracy. Mm -hmm. Hard work must be rewarded. This is a baby for Let's 15 years. Story. Story. Let's come around to the story of Capital Bank, the Universal Bank, and tell us how uh, you led it until you left. And if you are still listening, you are listening to William Atuesian, who is the founder of Capital Bank. He's given us an interview for the first time in many years, and you must have heard a lot about him. So um, g tell us a story about the days leading to acquisition of the Provisional Universal Banking License. Right. I, I mean, um, three things that happened. Mm -hmm. um, when you want to migrate from a savings and loan to a universal bank, um, under Basel 1, capital is very critical, but Basel 2, operational risk is important. So these are two things that must be looked at. Again, like the first scenario that I gave to you when we submitted our loans and advances as a reference to qualify as capital, it was the same manner that we did. 
migrating from a savings and loan to an investment. So you were the first MD of the Universal Bank? Correct. Okay, who else was there? What, with the top management, how did it look like? Um, we had um, Dr. John Kofimisa. Mm -hmm. um, he was my deputy at the savings and loans level. Um, we had Osa Thompson Mensa. He was executive director. Dr. Kofi Mensa is the current managing director of the ADB. Correct. Mm. Correct. Mm. Correct. Um, so we we had a very solid team, a very solid team. And board chairman was. was uh, board chairman was Dr. Mensa Otabel. There's something I have to ask you about your relationship with Dr. Otabel because part of the narrative that was carried out was that you are so close to Dr. Otabel, like a son of his, and so that the board chairman's regulatory function over the management was failing because of your relationship with Dr. Utabel. How, how do you respond It's to rather that? the opposite. The if opposite? It, it, yeah, yeah. If anybody pulled the brakes, it was Dr. Otabel. Believe you me, Paul. Because, because you have a very good relationship with yes, him. Yes, but what he said has chewed man who speak truth to power regardless of who you are. You can sleep in Dr. Otabel's house today, and if Dr. Otabel has to tell you what you did was wrong, it's not going to change. He'll look you in the face and tell you it's wrong. And he's one of the people. I mean, look, in board meetings, Dr. Otabel displays such level of intelligence. Bankers. You know, Hario Usu, he was the yeah, chairman yeah. of uh, Ghana Revenue Authority. Yeah, yeah. Yes, he was former banker. Mm -hmm. He could ask him, Mr. Chairman, where do you get this level of skills? Bankers would be asking the chairman his level of astuteness. It's amazing when I hear people talk about the fact that um, he didn't have um, understanding of what I, I, it, it's something, of course, like I said, this is the right time I failed to speak. But if anybody pulled the brakes, if anybody disciplined William Atwesian, if anybody had influence to bring to bear, it was Dr. Otterbill. And Dr. How then does, it, so is this propaganda? Is this a, a narrative that people have created? It's unfortunate. Mm. It's unfortunate, Paul. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. He's a holy, sacred man of God. And believe you me, his integrity is on power. What you see the man in, 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 in secret, that's who he is in public. Mm. It's amazing. And I'm saying this without fear of favor, but he's one man, his yes is yes, and his no is no. So he, 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 how he, can, he led the board. Paul, and, how, can, how can anybody even think about that? 482 million. Ezekiah Abazi, why are you taking it to? Why are you going to put it? Why are you going to hide it? Who does that? Paul. At which point did you leave the bank as MD? I left the bank 2012 in October. Mm -hmm. And who took over? Um, Dr. John Kofimisa. He became the MD of the he bank. But you remain the, the director and the shareholder. Yes, I remain a director and a shareholder. And the majority shareholder. That's right. So you were attending board meetings. Yes, I did. Did you have any conflicts at that time with Dr. Kofimisa having been old MD and on the board? Not at all. No, not at all. I, I, I think um, if there is anything to talk about Dr. Kofimisa, I would think that he's one of the finest technocrats that we have. In, in he was opinion. very experienced. He came to you from Win Unibank. Very experienced. Mm -hmm. Very experienced. So then he left, and then who came in? Um, all right, so he resigned. Mm -hmm. And um, when he left, um, Dr. It's not Dr. Reverend Fitzgerald Odonko. He's a board member. He was already a board he member. He was already a board member. Okay, yes. okay, okay. He was a non executive director. Okay. So okay. then he had to transition as a non executive director to. And executive director mm. and the chief executive officer of the bank. I said he had experience with Echo Bank as well. Yeah, he was with Echo Bank and, and Merchant, um, Bank. Merchant Bank. Correct. I see. Correct. But you remain on the you remain a director. I still of the remain company. a non-executive director from 2012. Okay. Yes. So give us a scenario of your bank in terms of what whether you were raising money in the year say 2016. Mm. When did the second liquidity support come in? Did you remember? Um, I think in 2016. Yeah, so before yes. that liquidity support came in, That's you right. must have been finding money. That's uh, right. Because the entire banking system in Ghana was, was struggling from petroleum That's right. issues. That's right. That we all know, also That's from right. the crash of the CD. That's right. That, that everyone had That's talked right. about. What, right. what, what, what activities did you carry out to find money? Okay, so I mean, I had worked for the bank mm -hmm. even when I stepped down. Mm -hmm. Because remember, it's my baby. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, I get challenged. When this thing happened, I thought I was going to get sympathizers to say, that is 15-year journey, a young man. And because Capital Bank could have become a Barclays Bank in the next 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. because I had my eye on the African market. And I was very, very hot, um, surprised that I was rather being castigated. This is well, what they, they, they were told you had chopped money. Exactly. And I, and I asked myself, how can you steal from yourself, Paul? How can you steal from yourself? Is that possible? Wow. Think about it. Did you do you travel to find money somewhere? Did I travel to find some money. To I find engage money? a lot of people. Ray, Mo, Ray Sowa, the current GCB managing director, mm -hmm. he has at the time working with GIB London. 
Resor led me to a gentleman called Mr. Goldsmith. Mm -hmm. That the gentleman was going to help us to raise about thirty-five million dollars. We needed to pay a hundred thousand in London. You mean you you went to Resor in London? We went to Resor in, in London. Who, I went with who led you to Resor? Um, Mr. Yofi Grant, the the GIPC the boss. GIPC boss. Mm -hmm. Yes. He led you to Resor. He led to me to Resor to find money. Mm -hmm. Um, a hundred thousand, um, thirty-five million um, euro. And uh, we got all the documents indicating the fact that the money was going to be availed to us. So we needed to pay 100,000 euro in fulfillment of condition precedent. Mm -hmm. Then the crystallization follows. Mm -hmm. As we speak today, I'm hoping for that crystallization to happen. Did, he, did you pay the 100,000 euro? I did. You paid to who? I paid to the company of Mr. Goldsmith, reference Mr. Resoa, the managing director of GCB Bank. So. But, but you didn't get your money, you didn't get a 35 million. We didn't million. get a 35 million dollars. Did you complain to Ray so I did, happened? I did. I went to London many times to talk to Ray. Did you tell Yofi Grant that the money didn't come? Yofi took me to him. He knew that money didn't come. Have you tried to see you? Um, you know, there are some things that you, you, you better walk a uh, quiet walk. So do you think that Ray so and Yofi Grant may have fleeced you? I'm not sure about um, that. I'm not sure about that. I, I think they meant well. Um, but as to the depth of how well they knew Ambrose Goldsmith, I'm not able so to Ambrose tell. Goldsmith is a British man. He's a Ghanaian. Oh, Ambrose Goldsmith is a yes, Ghanaian. He's a Ghanaian. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Ghanaian, Ghanaian. Ghanaian, Ghanaian. Three Ghanaian. Three Ghanaian. Three Ghanaian. But he's based in London. He's based in London. And he worked for which company? Um, that's the name of his company. Ambrose Goldsmith. Ambr Ambrose Goldsmith. And he said he was going to get you 35 million from million where? Euro. From where? Um, from a British um, company. Um, you can't the remember. The Rothschild. Rothschild. They, yes. they, have, they have investment yes, in Fidelity. They have investment Bank. in Fidelity. Bank. Yes, 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 yes. Rothschild yes. is a credible yes. company. Yes. Yes. And Ambrose Goldsmith said he was going to get you that money. Yes. Showed us all papers, all documentation to that effect. So they're going to send that money to capitalize. Uh, capital bank. Yeah, because you know, like for equity. Yeah, for equity. Because I had told you mm -hmm. that we had ring things that mm -hmm. Bank mm -hmm. of Ghana had given us five years dispensation mm -hmm. to underwrite the bad bank with a dividend that was going to accrue from the good bank. Mm -hmm. You understand. Mm -hmm. And so what we was looking for was looking for an investor mm -hmm. to come into the good bank. Mm -hmm. So I was traveling all over the world. So starting looking for money for the bank, Paul. There are some hotels room that I woke up and I didn't know the country that I was in. Because oh, I was sitting in the plane from D.C., the next day I'm in India, the next day I'm in Hong Kong, the next day I'm in Germany. You have to remind Germany. yourself where I you are. I have to remind myself where I am. My wife will tell you, I mean, the kind of sweat that we have poured in our quest of building this African... But why did you pay 100,000 euro? In Nigeria, they call it advance fee fraud, or they call it a suspicion of advance fee fraud. Why the, did you the, pay? The, we, we, we were given all the documentation. All that the, the money was ready. Yeah, that the money was ready. We're giving all the documentation. Did you involve your lawyers in this? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. So how did he explain to you that the money will not come? I and how, by the way, how did you pay the 100,000 euros? It was euros a transfer. From Ghana to his account? From Ghana, yes. It was a transfer. Wow. What, what did Reisoa say about this? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> Resoa was confident that um, Ambrose was going to come through. He, 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 he was very confident at the time. He just thought that it was just a matter of time, but he was extremely confident the man was going what to What did Yofi Grant say about that? Um, Yofi was confident, too, that the man was going to come through. Which, which part of 2016 was this? Um, um, Early or later? I think this is maybe 2015. 15. Yes. Okay. This is so me. when did you give up that your 35 million was not going to come? Did we give up? We never gave up. Oh, you're still waiting for it? No. I mean, at the time the bank was in existence, yeah. we were waiting for it. Because we what kind of communication did you have with him? We were communicating going? every time. What was he saying? I mean, he indicated that the processes was, I mean, it was in a queue. Did like you write queue? to Rothschild and say? We did. And what did they say? Yes. They indicated that we were in a queue. It was a queuing system. Mm -hmm. Yes. But by the time you were paying the 100,000, he didn't tell you it was a queue. He, you, you believe that as soon as you pay the 100,000, you get you know, the money. You know, Paul, if somebody brings me to you, mm -hmm. Resor was not a mere person. Yeah, he was, a, he was an MD of the, of the GCB in London. Yeah, I mean, a renowned person, a reputable lawyer. So I have no reason. And you have an investment banker from yes. Data Bank. Yes. Yeah. You know, so, so I have no reason to doubt hmm. the engagement I was getting into. 
I have no reason to doubt it. How do you report this to your board and uh, the board? They of directors? knew that I was on um, looking for money. I had gone to raise money. I was with Dr. Inchil. We had traveled the world to look for money. So when we got this information, we relayed to the, to, to the board. This is not something that we did in our individual capacities, no. We relayed it. We sent all the documentation to the board for the board's perusal. Did you involve the Bank of Ghana in, in letting them know how far you're going with yes. trying to... Yes, we had to report everything to the central bank. Look, the day... Have you now written to Ambrose, uh, what's his name again? Ambrose Goldsmith. Uh, Ambrose Goldsmith and said that we are demanding the 100,000 euros. Yes. You have written to him we to have. demand it. We have. But you look, can't find him. Look, we can find him. You know, that's what exactly I'm saying to you, that on the day that the bank was collapsed, mm -hmm. We had an investor in, 20s, in 2014th of August, 2017. 2017, yes. We had an investor mm -hmm. who had given us um, a certificate of undertaking of bringing in almost about 400 million Ghana cities to the bank. Yeah, that would be enough to recapitalize. That was more than enough. Yeah. At the time, we had not even got into Is the Was this investor local? It was investor from India. Did you share with Bank of Ghana? We did. We gave all the co copies to the central bank. Uh, did they disbelieve you? They do. I don't think they did. I don't think they did. I mean, for me, what happened on the 14th of August was a shocker. Because we were... Where were you on the 13th of August? 14th the day of August. Before. The day before. Where were you? The day before. Yeah. Um, were you in Ghana? It was, yeah, I was in Ghana. Um, did you get wind of something? Did you get any idea? I, you know, prior to that, um, the AQR report had come up. And, um, I mean, basically, you know, these things, they do happen. But... To tell you that I knew that was going to happen. I, what about the boldest advisors, which we all read? Paul, that is probably one of the unfortunate documentation put together by a consultant. How can a consultant put a documentation of that nature together and use words like piggy bank? It's a see the gentleman had something against me. And I wonder, the day I meet him, I ask him, sir, where do you know me from? Did I do anything to offend you? Because if you're doing such a report, Paul, the courtesy or the right thing to do is to tell me. Because, Paul, in finance, a debit can become a credit and a credit can become a debit based mm. on the narration. Mm. And nobody had institutional memory more than William Atwisian because I founded it. I understood. So if you're going to talk to people who had worked with the institution for just a year or a year and a half, what institutional memory did they have to help you to situate figures? Are you suggesting to us that the boldest advisors never spoke to you? They never spoke to me, Never. Paul. Never. The majority shareholder. Never. Never, Paul. Really? So sad. Never. I mean, Never. they were doing an audit they were doing of your bank. Of my bank. And you are the majority shareholder. You had been MD of yes. the bank. Yes. They never spoke they to never you. They never spoke to me, Paul. They never spoke to me. Who did they speak to then? I don't know who they spoke to. They who never. commissioned the boldest advisors I report? I don't know. But it is I mean, not report that leaked into the media. That, that's, that's that boldest advisors that leaked into the media. But that's what I heard. That was what I heard. That was why I said I didn't want to speak at the time because the noise was too much. Because... Boulders reports you're doing such a very important document like that. The founder. Who else do you know the, that they spoke to in your bank? Was, apart from, they didn't speak um, to you, yes. Did they speak to board of directors? Well, they, I don't. I, I think they spoke to um, um, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. um, he had been with the bank for just about a year and two months. What was he? CFO. Okay. He had been with the bank for just about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then they spoke to, I think, um, the managing director. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but he had been for just about two years. Did they, they speak to the chairman of the board? I'm not sure. They didn't? I'm not sure. And for you, you are certain they didn't speak to you? They never spoke to me, Paul. That, that cannot be a they proper never way. Spoke that, to that, me. that certainly cannot be a good they job. They never spoke that to you're me. doing an audit of a bank, and you are checking what the bank has used liquidity support for. That's right. And you don't speak to the majority shareholder, who's also the director of the company. That's right. And then you accuse him. You accuse him. Oh, that's wrong. Yes. That's, that's very wrong. And you use words like he was using his piggy bank. I mean, I was not managing director. I mean, who does that? And again, I'm I said. I read that report. Was, so there's nowhere in the report where they said Atuesian told us that. They, they couldn't quote no, you anywhere. No, they anything. couldn't quote me anywhere. You can check it. They didn't speak to you. They never spoke to me. Oh, but that, that, that's. They never spoke to me. That's very They yeah. never spoke to me. They never spoke to me. And I come back to the same point. It was my baby. Look, when so, this so thing when happened... you know that Boulder's I, advisors had done some work on your bank? Well, for, I, for the government, at the Ministry of Finance, at the bank? When this Ghana. thing was in the media, I was hearing figures being fl flying everywhere. It didn't make sense to me. So, uh, where is the source of these figures? Because it didn't make sense. Let's get back to 2016. 
and the liquidity support. Did you apply for it, or did the Bank of Ghana tell you you needed it? What happened? No, we applied for liquidity support. Like as I said, it's a regular thing. Was it the first time you were applying for liquidity support? Yes. I mean, okay. you know, the Bank of Ghana is a lender of last resort. Mm -hmm. I mobilized money for the bank. Mm -hmm. I mobilized the money, money from government institution, high net worth individual, HNIs. I've man mobilized money from every source that you could ever think about, including the travels all over the world, mm -hmm. to get in a strategic investor to come in for us to be able to what? Leap that head up. And so when it came to liquidity support, um, the management of the bank did the needful, and then they went to the Bank of Ghana, spoke to them, and then referencing. But obviously, um, I was a founder of the bank. The burden I carried was greater and so the passion with which I would want to approach things is a little different. Mm -hmm. And that passion in quest in line with corporate governance was what we presented to the central bank for them to see the picture of what, how well the good bank was performing. When they gave us the first liquidity support, they saw how well we have utilized it. Then they were encouraged knowing that. So, so you took a first one? Yes. Did you pay back? We were paying. We paid all in two, this 2016. The 2016, okay, the took, liquidity support that we took was not free money. Let yeah. me quickly mm -hmm. put it on record. Liquidity support is a loan. That's how the central bank makes money. Mm -hmm. It was a loan at a 25.5% interest. Paul, when we got the liquidity support, the first, second, and the third, what we submit, submitted to the central bank was very simple. You know, government didn't need to lose, lose, lose all the kind of money that it's lost. Paul, let me ask you a candid question. If you're going to have to get a car, and you're going to have to save this car with 100 CDs, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to destroy this car, and it's going to cost you 1,000, which of the two are you going to go for? I'll save it with 100 CDs. Exactly the point. My point is government didn't need to go this route. So you mean that the 12 billion, or in some accounts says 11 billion, and some accounts says 14 billion. Where is that money? That had been used to recover. Where is that money? Was not necessary? Was not necessary. Let me tell you something. The, Capital Bank has 610 million with the Bank of Ghana. We're paying interest of 14 million CDs every month. Interest payment had only had accrued to 254. It was money we had paid to the central bank. Okay, so after collecting 600 million from the 610, 620, 620 in liquidity support from the central support, bank. So from the you central are saying bank. that in August 2017, you had paid back 254 million. And you were still paying? In interest payment, and we're still paying. What What did you use that money for, to be able to pay? Was it lending, What well, yes, normal well, banking business? Yes, because you see, you're paying interest only, so the money cannot sit down. Mm -hmm. You have to use the money to make economic sense of the money. Yes, yes, So yes. we created loan. GCB picked up the good asset. You remember when they were doing the selection of assets and liabilities? Mm -hmm. GCB picked up almost about close to 300 million Ghana city worth of good assets. With so, the bank? With the bank. Mm -hmm which was referenced to liquidity as well. If you add these two to it, you are in the region of 600 million. So when people say, we well, chop money, wh wh who does that? I mean, it's a very difficult thing I find, but let me just help you to appreciate one point. Liquidity support is a loan. Liquidity support is not free money. We That's told the impression central bank. That people got that you had been dashed money to, no, to build the bank no, and you just blew it. No, it's not true. Liquidity support is not free money. It is money that comes with an interest. And the bank needed to make economic sense of that money. Paul, all we told central bank was three things. Number one, we told central bank that, listen, interest forgive us. Because if the central bank had just interest forgive us, the 14 million cities we are paying on month on month is 188 million in a year. That would have gone straight into our income. You didn't want to, to pay the interest. Yes. Interest you forgive to pay us. the principal. We wanted to pay the principal. Mm -hmm. Interest forgave us. If the interest forgave us, 188 million would have gone but into the interest. But the interest was 25%, you said. It was 25%. So you could have negotiated down to say 10%. I mean, we, were, we told them that. That negotiate, give us opportunity to pay 10%. The central bank will not budge. We said, all right, then why don't you convert the 620 million into equity and own the bank? Mm -hmm. So that people don't need to lose their jobs. Yes. Yes. So we said, do that. And the central bank says, I will not do it. Now, you come and you say you put 12 billion when you could have just interest forgave for the institution to have gone on. There wouldn't have been uh, crisis in the market and all of that. Paul, I hear about solvency, solvency. Listen, an insolvent bank in the presence of market confidence can correct the insolvency. Mm -hmm. A solvent bank in the presence of no market confidence will collapse. 
Let, let's understand that again. So you mean a solvent bank? Yes. Okay, Barclays. Solvent. Yes. When there's no market confidence and we are all going for and our money, everybody's going for the Barclays won't survive. Barclays won't survive. An insolvent bank, Bank X. Yes. Even Capital. Yes. Has confidence, yes. so we are not going for our market money. confidence. Is there. we don't know that they are insolvent we don't, we don't, we don't because we're not going for our money. That's right. Nobody's announcing to us press conference after press That's conference right. that That's we are right. insolvent, so That's we are right. not coming. You're not. So you take a bank like the Consolidated Bank. Yes. You are suggesting that if government were to give them five billion today, yes, and people don't have confidence, and everybody's waiting for the money I had at Unibank, the money I had at Beige, Correct. the money I had Correct. at this, and the money I had at Correct. that. And we hear that Consolidated has been giving them money. We all go for we money. We all go for your they money. They become insolvent, they become insolvent the same again. Afternoon. The same afternoon. Mm. Because currently, look, what had happened to Ghana, we're going to need about five years, ten years to right it or wrong. For confidence to come back in the system, because people are putting money under their bed. So you said we shouldn't... You said it, you, so you are saying that insolvency yes. is not a mathematical concept. It's not a mathematical concept. It's a concept. sociological it's concept. It's a sociological concept. That's, that's interesting. Yes, sir. So you don't look at figures and you say don't. the bank is insolvent. No. It has a lot to do with sociology. Sociology. If there's no confidence, every, ba every bank will be every insolvent. Bank Goldman be insolvent. Sachs. Every bank will Merrill be insolvent. Merrill Lynch. Every one of them. Every one of them.